I've been through a lot of RPGs in my life. Some had a classic ADB style combat, some other had a turn-based combat, and some other had something completely different. But I've also played my share of action RPGs, from the Legend of Zelda to the East series with its old bump system and its more new hack and slash like system. But among all RPGs I've played, there were two in particular that built a combat system which doesn't make the character fight all in the same way. What I mean is that they have a main character with far more abilities and options compared to the other party members, which then become an extension of that character's fighting style. I'm talking about The Last Story for the Wii and Final Fantasy XV for the PS4 and PC. It's interesting that these two games we're talking about here because, for those who don't know, The Last Story comes from the mind of Hironobu Sakaguchi, the creator of the Final Fantasy franchise. But I'm getting off topic. These two games both have a main character on which the battle system is built upon. That would be Zael for The Last Story and Noctis for Final Fantasy XV. While their combat styles are completely different, with Zael playing mostly a tank role and Noctis playing a glass cannon, they have some similar ideas behind. So let's discuss how each game builds upon this protagonist-centered combat system in its own way, and why this is a good thing for plot progression as well. Obviously, there will be spoilers from both games, so you've been warned. As we can see from the status menu of the last story, Zeo has far more abilities than anyone else, but let's take a look on how the game builds this up from the very beginning. As soon as the game starts, Zeo's combat looks pretty similar to Dagron's or Serem's. The only additional thing he can do is shooting with his crossbow, which gives him some long-range capabilities. But it's not far from the start of the game when the true mechanic of which is the core of the last story's combat is acquired, the power of the outsider, specifically the gathering ability. Gathering is the base of all other abilities of Zeo. Gathering is activated by pressing a button. When activation, every enemy who can see Zeal will target him and will move slower for a certain period of time. Additionally, Zeal recovers some HP when he deals damage and a light mages cast a spell twice as fast. You see, if a mage wants to cast a spell, they have to charge it up for a certain amount of time, and if they get hit during the charge, they have to start over. This way you can see why gathering really helps in the casting process. Not only it makes casting faster, but mages won't be bothered by enemies because they're all focused on Zeal. Casting spells ties into another ability that Zeal gets pretty early on, Gale. With Gale, Zale can jump to a specific point of the field, deal little AOA magic damage, but most importantly diffuse magic circles on the landing spot. Magic circles are left on the ground after a spell is cast and they can imbue the weapon of who steps in them with that element, allowing for greater damage and possibly the chance to hit elemental weaknesses. Enemies who step in the circle also take damage over time of that element, but diffusing circles, while it makes them disappear, inflicts the AOE elemental damage on the enemies around it, and most importantly a debuff such as silence or slip. Heal and Light Circles is that buff the party by healing HP and removing debuffs from the former and granting a defensive barrier for the latter. Zale also gets Vertical Slice later on, which is a wall jump that fuses circles farther and harder and it has pros so pros and cons, but that's for another time to discuss. Another ability that Zale gets tied to Gathering is Slash. This allows Zale to hide behind an obstacle and slash enemies for increased damage. If Gathering was activated before hiding, often enemies would be confused for a second, which, again, allows Zale to inflict even more damage with Slash. Moving on in the game, Zale obtains Gathering Burst. When Gathering is active and Zale is hit three times, he will charge up a burst up. After three more hits, he will charge up burst max. Releasing Gathering at this point shoots some magic beam toward all enemies, which deal magic damage and slows them down. The last ability that Zale gets is Guard Counter, which allows him to parry an enemy attack and counterattack back for massive damage. It also allows him to bounce spell back at enemies. While not tied directly to Gathering, aggroing more enemies just means more chances to Guard Counter. The culmination of this buildup of skills happens during one of the last battles of the game, when Zale faces Zangorak, King of the Grak. Zangorak, like Zale, also obtained the power of the Outsider, but the alpha opposite to Zale's. As such, he also has Gathering, Gathering Burst, and Guard Counter, although they do different things or work differently than Zale's version. And like Zale can gale across the screen, Zangorak can too. However, this gale, ironically, looks more like a Warp Strike from Final Fantasy XV. He literally throws his weapon at someone and teleports to it. That's a Warp Strike in my book. Now that we talked about how Zeo builds up his strength, let's see how this affects the plot. 
In the last story, there's an interesting thing that is done straight from the start. As you begin a new game, you don't play as the protagonist's tale, but as Dagron. In the first couple of minutes as Dagron, the game teaches you the basic of combat. Then you switch to Zale, which apart from the crossbow, fights the same way as Dagron. But as soon as Zale gets the power of the outsider, he becomes different and way better than Dagron. This is important for the direction of the storytelling. In the mercenary group of Zale and Dagron, they all consider each other family, but even a family has a streaky hierarchy which must be respected. In this case, Zale and Dagron, as the founders of the group, are the ones in command and are the ones giving all the strategic orders, with Dagron being just above Zale in this hierarchy. But with his newfound powers, Zale subverts this hierarchy and now stands as the most important member instead of Dagron. While Dagron does learn some skill throughout the game, the gap between him and Zale grows larger and larger as the game progresses. This is especially emphasized when Dagron straight up tells Zale to take the lead because he hurt his eye. I had my eye during all the confusion. You okay? It's nothing serious, but we can't take any risks. Zale, I want you to take the lead. It's imperative we don't get caught. Leave it to me. In the gameplay's perspective, this gives you access to command mode, which you can use to control allies to a degree. As you, Zale, grow stronger and stronger, Dagron becomes more and more of a replaceable party member. And if it was something you did on purpose, because Dagron happens to have the worst overall stats of all characters. Also, halfway through the game, Dagron leaves the team for a while. The following moments are the most action-packed and hectic moments of the game, and they quickly make you forget about Dagron. Since he was so weak in combat, you don't really miss him in your party, so you forget about him. But when he comes back, you feel bad for having forgotten about him and thinking he wasn't that useful. And this is made even more personal because you, the player, have played as Zale the whole time and experienced the growth in power that Dagron did not. While Final Fantasy XV does make Noctis a useful party member, you don't feel too handicapped in the sword section when you control Gladio and Ignis. The last story instead wants you to feel severely underpowered when you don't control Zale. This doesn't happen very often, but the best example of this concept is where you control Lowell for the first time. This is made so you can learn how to manually control a mage and you have to go through 3 or 4 battles without Zale. I can bet anyone on their first playthrough accidentally tried to use Gathering while using Lowell just because they were so used to control Zale. I know I did. That makes you miss Zale in battle even more and makes you look forward to the moment where you're back in his control. Mr. Walker really wanted the player to relate to Zale and feel like they were Zale. This is also the reason why Zale doesn't seem to have the sense of smell. After all, the player can see what happens in the game, can hear the sounds of the game, but can't smell what the other characters can. Oh, it stinks! The hell is that smell? Huh? What's up with you two? Zale, can't you smell anything? That's about it for the last story. Let's see what the other game has to offer. Oh boy, Final Fantasy XV, the game in which battles can be won by simply holding circle and spamming items. But we're not here to talk about that, we're here to talk about the progression of Noctis' power. Mainly his main gimmick, Warping. Warping is available immediately as you begin the game. Exactly as gathering the last story to warp you just press a button. Pick a direction, tap the warp button and Noctis will throw his weapon forward and warp to it. This can be used to move quickly through the field to cover large distances in a short amount of time, or when locked onto an enemy can be used to warp strike the enemy closing the distance and doing more damage the further away the enemy was. Soon after you get introduced to point warping. During a battle, Noctis can point warp to scripted points around the field. Doing so recovers all of his MPs which he uses to warp, and if the point warp spot was high up, makes him hang on with his sword to recover HP at the cost of his stamina and stay out of harm's way. Point warp spots are also useful to create large distance between the player and the enemies, allowing the chance of powerful warp strikes. At first, this is all you use warping for, but you quickly figure out that Noctis uses warping in a lot of other ways. For example, holding the odds button to face through enemies' attacks at the cost of MPs is also a form of warping. It's more subtle, but it's still warping. The so-called air steps, which allow Noctis to remain airborne for longer periods of time, are also a form of warping. Another way warping is used in combat is when Noctis allies use their skills. It doesn't happen with all of them, but look how Noctis uses warping to add follow-ups to his friend's skills. Take a look at Gladius Tempest. You ran? Damn, yeah. nice work, yeah. Or at Prompto's Piercer. Pronto, you're up. Oh. Hi there, opening. <laughs> 
Other skills have warping as a main component instead. Look at two of my favorite skills in the game. Gladius Tornado. Showtime! Gladius, do it! Here we go! Over here! Nailed it! Thanks! Yeah. And Ignis's mark. Hey, Ignis! Are you mocked? Uh huh! You can tell that these are just an extension of Noctis' warping ability. Now as you progress through the game you get introduced to the Royal Arms, powerful weapons that only Noctis can wield. While pretty powerful and able to ignore enemies' weapon resistances, they also drain Noctis' health with every hit. It's clear that the game wants you to use these weapons to do a lot of damage while sacrificing your health, and then point warp away to recover and resume your soul later. But that's not the only way Royal weapons interact with warping. When Noctis warp strikes with any other weapon, it simply throws the weapon to the target. Royal Weapons have a unique Warp Strikes animation and modifiers. Let's take a look at some of those. Pronto! Stop bitching! Start killing! We're outnumbered. I propose we take them out one by one. On all out. Just don't get too carried away. Sure want to talk. Gotcha. But wait, you thought it was over? No, because as you acquire the third royal weapon, Noctis gains access to our misery. Some kind of devil trigger, which is basically a festival of warping as Noctis warps all around the enemies and hits them with all of his royal weapons. I can't really describe it miserably, well, just take a look at it. Warp striking during our major also has unique animation. You're on fire today! No big deal. Nothing to it. This is all the progression Noctis gets in terms of his powers. And exactly like Zeol, it culminates in the first phase of the final boss fight where Arden fights the same way as he does. He can warp, he can phase through attacks and cast spells just as Noctis can. He later even conjures his own version of the Armager as he battles Noctis above the skies of Insomnia. And I just noticed something. Noctis' warp color is blue and Arden's is red. Zeol's gathering color is blue and Zagreg is red. Coincidence? I think not. Final Fantasy XV doesn't do as good as a job in the plot department, which let's be honest is all over the place. It emphasizes more on the relation between Noctis and the three bros, Prompto, Gladio and Ignis, and the way Noctis himself is depicted. While the last story is set in a medieval world, Final Fantasy XV is set in a modern world. There are cars, guard stations, fast food chains and street lights all over the place. People have cell phones, they watch TV or listen to the radio, and Venice looks exactly as it looks like in reality, a tourist trap, just a lot clearer than the real one. No, seriously, I live like 30 minutes from Venice, I think I'm entitled to complain a bit about this. Back to our topic, though. Because the world of Final Fantasy XV is very similar to ours, it's easy to relate to what the characters say and do. Especially Noctis, who, behind the power of kings, is just an ordinary young man. He drives the car, he hangs out with his best friends, goes fishing every now and then, likes taking selfies and plays video games with his friends after a long day of work. Or hunting. By playing pretty much the whole game with Noctis, it's inevitable that the player starts to get in his shoes. The player is also asked to decide some of the answers that Noctis will give to some dialogue. And while there usually are no wrong answers, it adds some of the player personality to the game, which is important. Throughout the first half of the game, the player has the time to sink in their relation with the three bros, and gets to spend a lot of time with them, both in combat and outside of combat. Impressive, You've grown stronger. Must be thanks to my balanced diet. The one that excludes vegetables. Yep, that's the one. Noctis is also seen as the leader of the group from the bros, Probably mainly for his royal lineage and you, as the player, can choose not only how Noctis will develop his skills in the astral plane, but also the bros. To recap with what we said, in the first half of the game the player gathers power and slowly comes to understand their relations with the bros. And then comes Altitia. 
While this part of the game starts kind of chill, the fight with the Leviathan is where things get real. While the fight is not hard, there's more what it represents that counts. In the first phase, Leviathan is fast, flies all over the sky and swims below the sea, and you can't really do anything except warping from place to place, hoping to get an opening to warp strike it. And even when you do, the damage you can deal is minimal. But then the fight is interrupted by a cutscene. Noctis bride to be Luna Freya is stabbed to death by Arden, and you're powerless to do anything about it. Luna Freya, on her last moments, invokes the power of the kings of Yor to help you fight Leviathan. You lie on the ground, filled with a mix of rage and sadness as the power of kings flows into you. With newfound strength, you rise into the sky and do this. Even though the battle is just old circle to win, the first time I played I was just admiring the spectacle of this fight. This giant sea snake, almost impossible to hit even just a minute ago, now doesn't stand a chance against the full power of the King of Kings. After that, a bunch of bad stuff happens, and suddenly the relationship between Noctis and the bros takes a very dark and depressing tone. It's the opposite of the Leviathan fight. A moment ago it was all nice and good, and the day after everything looks bad. But you keep on going, because after all, that's not a reason to give up on your task. So you persevere, even when you know what lies at the end of the tunnel, because that's what you have to do as a true king and a true friend. In conclusion, combat systems which are focused on the abilities of the protagonist can create a very deep level of engagement with the player as they grow in power and by exploring the evolution of the relationship between the protagonist and the other party members during this growth of power. As I said in the beginning, while I play a lot of JRPGs and action RPGs, I still yet to find another title that explores this concept apart from these two games. If you know of any other games with a protagonist-centered combat system where other party members work as an extension of it, feel free to let me know in the comments, and as always, See you all in the next video.